Well, you may have read the book, the Guinness Book of World Records. And if you have, you know that it's stocked with a lot of trivia, right? For example, the world's heaviest man was 1,069 pounds. The tallest man on record, supposedly, was 8 feet 11 inches, and he wore a size 37 AA shoe. It states that the world's record for a mother bearing children was by a Russian peasant woman who had 69 children. She had eight sets of twins, uh, seven sets of triplets, and four sets of quads. But you know, there is a blaring era in the Guinness Book of World Records. Guinness, it, it, because in that book, it says that the oldest woman to bear children was in 1956, October 1956, and she was at, of the age of 57. Well, they obviously didn't hear about Sarah, right? Well, the last part of Romans chapter 4, which we find ourselves today, focuses upon the events surrounding the true world record of the oldest mother to ever bear a child. The Apostle Paul has just finished a masterful argument for the justification by faith, culminating in a summary statement in chapter 3, verse 28, which says, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works. By faith apart from works. And what does he do? The Apostle Paul takes, as we saw last week, he takes two of the heroes of the Jewish people, that of Abraham and that of David, and he holds them up and he says, I just want to show you. Now remember, he's he's finishing this discourse on the fact that we're not saved by Speaking to the Jew religious person, not saved by religion, not saved by good works. And as we saw even before that, we saw that Paul said that one is not saved who lives a good moral life, though that often is the thought. I mean, how many times do you hear it over and over, people saying, well, I I hope I live a good life so I can see my husband and my wife who's passed away. And so again, Paul says, Abraham, justified by faith alone. David, even in David's repentance, we see between the lines of Scripture of the fact that Peter says, I mean, Paul says, David, I'll get to it in a minute. (laughs) David says, God did not impute his unrighteousness, his unrighteousness. That was on, uh, on the, in the context of his confessing his sin with Bathsheba. And so what we saw last week is that you read between the lines, if he didn't impute unrighteousness to him, then we would assume that he imputed righteousness even to David. Which again, uh, the fact that God declares an ungodly man, both Abraham and David, that God declares an ungodly man godly, even when he's ungodly, was a miracle. That's what was my point last week. I mean, miracle is that which goes against the natural. And the natural says you don't get something without, nothing, without doing something. And yet, Paul said, Abraham, he believed God. And God charged to his account deposited on his spiritual bank account righteousness, perfect righteousness. Hmm. And, and his, the point there, the major point that he made is that Genesis 15, and we went there last week, that Genesis 15, 6 means what it says when it says Abraham, or he, believed the Lord, and he, he God, credited it to him as righteousness. Abraham's perfect righteousness by faith was established some 14 years before he was circumcised. That was his point. The Jews would say, wait, 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 what about being circumcised? We're Jew. That should be enough. Hey, we get, we're in, right? No. They said, what about Abraham? He was circumcised. Yeah, he was, but it was 
He was circumcised 14 years later after he believed God. And his faith was credited, uh, credited and counted as righteousness. Now, in our text today, and in Romans 4, 16 through 25, the Apostle Paul explains the nature of true faith by describing what went on in Abraham's heart, in mind, in reference to this miraculous world record setting birth, the birth of Isaac. In fact, arguably the most noticeable statement in this whole section is found in verse 18, in which it states that in hope, against hope, he believed. We're going to get more into that verse and dissect that verse later, but in hope, against hope, against all hope, he believed. Now, even without knowing Abraham, you have to see that sounds quite ominous. That sounds awesome to have that kind of faith. I mean, who wouldn't want to have that kind of faith? The faith that hopes, that has a confidence, and we're, again, we're going to dissect the, those words, that has a confidence in the face of that which seems hopeless. That's the point of the passage. And I would think that most of us would say, hey, th- th- this is the kind of faith that I'd like to have. I don't know about you, but I certainly would. Well, here it is, as if the Apostle Paul unfastens the, the wing nuts uh, on the top of Abraham's head, head, and he lifts it up, and he allows us to t- have a bird's eye view, if you will, uh, of the intimate knowledge of, and the working of Abraham's mind that brought him to that place where he had this faith that was Unbelievable faith. Today we were going to take a close look at that. And I might say that up to this point, as we've been walking, and this is the last message in the first four chapters, we're going to take a couple of weeks and look at some other passages for a couple of weeks. And then we're going to come back to um, Romans chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8. Uh, the book of Romans has been known as, uh, been referred to as the Magna Carta of the Christian faith. And we're going to come back to that section. And uh, th- this, this section so, uh, has been very tough. Uh, some of you have said to me, I've asked you at times uh, after church, how are you feeling? And some of you have said, well, I, I felt pretty good until I came to church today. And man, that, that was a tough message. Uh, well, that's, that was a, that's a, we've been preaching the whole counsel of God. But there's good news. Remember, it's bad news that leads to good news. And the good news is unbelievable. And that's what we're talking about. But today, it gets very practical. We get very practical in a sense because as Abraham, I mean, it's not Abraham, it was Paul brings the, the, the message, the, this section to kind of a close. His focus on Abraham is on his faith, this unbelievable faith. And, and I think the question that the passage begs is how does one come to a faith that hopes against hope, that has a confident hope against human hope that seems hopeless. Well, let's turn to Romans chapter 4. Let's get right into it. It's a great section. In chapter 4, beginning in verse 16 and 17, we want to start with those two verses. It says, For this reason it is by faith, in order that it may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants not only to those who are of the law, who are those? Jews, okay, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. To whom does he reference there? The Gentiles. He says faith, all those who follow in the faith that Abraham had, not his works, but in his faith. This is the message is for them. In verse 17 it says, as it is written, a father of many nations have I made you in the presence of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead. Now watch that phrase. You want to underline that, the, this whole end of this verse here, if you are, are highlighted. Um, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. <laughs> the God who gives life to the dead and calls things into existence that are non-existent. That was, 
what, what Paul was saying is that the, the object of Abraham's faith was focused upon God. Not his circumstances, not anything around him, but his God. He looked beyond the futility of his own situation, of his own dead body, so to speak, to a God who is much, much greater, who was capable of bringing into existence that which, from human viewpoint, is hopeless. You know, when life happens, and our lives are twisted by circumstances, difficulty, we have a choice. We can look at the insurmountability of that circumstance, or we can look at the gigantic God that walks over our circumstances and who brings into existence that which is non-existent. It's all about the object of our faith. You know, people today say, well, I have faith. Okay, faith in what? Well, I just have faith. You know, there, there's some people for, that can have faith and not live to tell about it a lot. Uh, for example, some people can have faith in thin ice. <laughs> uh, I, my previous church, I pastored in Ohio, and it, it, the church was in, name of the church was Community Church of Portage Lakes, and it was right outside of Akron, Ohio, and it was surrounded by 13 man-made lakes. You fishermen would love that place. In the summer, it was a resort. But in the winter, it was nothing but just ice. And every day I drove to, to the office, I'd look at these frozen lakes. Invariably, though, every year, somebody would walk out on the ice and fall through. Worse yet, some would even ride snowmobiles on the ice, and if it hit a weak spot or a shallow spot, a thin spot, they would go under the ice. And that's worse because when someone falls in the ice that cracks when they're walking, then, then you've got a chance to pull them out, though not very, you don't have very long. But if they go in with a snowmobile, it's over with. You're not going to find them. Well, you can have, they had faith in, in a weak object. Uh, let's say, illustrate it this way. I may leave church today with the utmost trust in my automobile to get me home. But if someone removes the lug nuts on my automobile and I'm on the way home, then my wheel, or one of the wheels, probably if not more than one, will come off, right? If on the other hand, if I have little faith in my car and I drive it home with fear and trepidation, but no one has pulled a prank on me and removed my lug nuts, then I can get home safely even though I have weak faith in my car. Why? Because the object of my faith is strong. That's the idea here. By scripture and by analogy, we learn that Abraham's faith was not an example to us primarily because it was so strong, and it was, but it is an example to us primarily because it demonstrates to us the object of his faith that connected with him, that enabled him. The decisive issue is where we place our faith. Abraham completely understood two com massive concepts about God. In verse 17, he understood that God gives life to the dead, even though there had not been any record of the resurrection, of any type of resurrection. There was the doctrine of resurrection, of a resurrection was not at that time present, existent. No. But Abraham believed in God's resurrected power. And I think that was borne out by the fact that when he obediently raised the knife above Isaac, what did he do? Why did he do that? Well, Genesis 23 tells us that he believed that God, if he did kill his son, that God would raise him. With, again, there's been no resurrection up to this point, right? But the other massive concept that he grasped 
is that he saw God as a God who calls things that are not in existence into existence. Obviously, he knew that God created this giant universe. But I think also the fact that Abraham refers to the fact this refers to Abraham's great faith of, of calling that which is non-existent into existence. I believe he understood that God was going to resurrect, you might say, his and Sarah's procreation organs, bring them back to life. He had to believe that. Even though his body, for all practical purposes, was dead. Now, Abraham's perception of God as the object of his faith was immense. And that's, that, that's what we want to walk away with today. Uh, the, the, the gigantic per- perception of God was so infused into his faith it, that it dominated every area of his thought. Not that he didn't struggle, they were human. But his God was a big God. There's a story told about a professor by the name of Robert Dick Wilson, who was a professor at Princeton Seminary years ago, the wrong before they went off the deep end and moved away from Orthodox Christianity. And the story tells that Dr. Wilson, uh, this great professor at Princeton, that one of his students who had been graduated for 12 years came back to speak at the chapel, Miller Chapel is what they called it. And he walked up to the front, sat down up front, listened to the his former student preach. And then when he got done, he came up to his former student and he said, I want you to know that if you come back again to preach, I won't come to hear you preach. (laughs) And he, uh, he said, because the reason I come to hear you preach is I want to know all my students, whether they are big godders or little godders. And the student asked him to explain more, and he went on to say, well, some men have a little God, and they are always in trouble with him. He can't do any miracles. He can't take care of the inspiration and transmission of Scripture to us. He doesn't intervene on behalf of his people. They have a little God, and I call them little Godders. (laughs) Then there are those who have a great God. He speaks, and it's done. He commands, and it stands fast. He knows how how to show himself strong on behalf of them that fear him. He said, you have a great God, and he will bless your ministry. Well, that's, that's the point here. The first point of the whole thing is the object of our faith. We must have a big God. We must be big godders. Job 26, 7 says, He stretches out the north over the empty space and hangs the earth on nothing. That says all, simply that God is the one who created this universe. Job 9, 8 says, Who alone stretches out the heavens and tramples down the waves of the sea? Of course, we know in Isaiah 40, it says, He measures all the waters in the palm of His hand that He calls all the stars by name. Abraham understood that God was a great God who created this universe. And I would say to you, if our view of God is as exalted as Abraham's, if we see God as so great, so vast, that he created things out of nothing, or that he creates things out of nothing, and he gives life to the dead, and if you and I really believe this, then we will be big godders, which will make an immense difference in our lives and everyday circumstance and how we approach everyday circumstances. Now, let's read on in Romans chapter 4, picking it up in verse 18. Here's the key verse. In hope against hope, he believed, so that he might, purpose clause here, when you see that, in order that, that he might become father of many nations according to that which has been spoken. So shall your descendants be. 
There are two obstacles in this passage that Abraham faced. And they come out very clearly. The first and perhaps the least obvious obstacle or barrier, you might say, was the fact that he, the, the promise of God. I mean, it was so wonderful, it was very difficult to believe. I mean, it was too good to be true, right? Someone I saw someone the other day talking about Facebook Marketplace and about someone who had been set up and a crime was committed. And someone said on the television there, said, if it's too good to be true, if it sounds too good to be true, more than likely it's too good to be true. This was too good to be true. You don't get something for nothing. But it is true. It is true. To think that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars above and the dust below, and that all the earth would be blessed through him, and the Messiah would come through the seed, and that he would obtain a standing before before God that he did not deserve. But the greatest obstacle was not the promise, but it was the clear biological impossibility of Abraham and Sarah that they could bear an offspring. God told Abraham, look, you're going to have many descendants. And in fact, he's, we know from Galatians, uh, among uh, other passages, that that promise, Abraham understood that promise to include the coming Messiah. But now here he is. He doesn't have, doesn't have any children. And so it was unbelievable. And when, plus, when God spoke to Abraham the first time, he was 85 years of age. But nonetheless, he believed the impossible. That's faith. Faith is seeing beyond that which is possible to that which is impossible. Remember what uh, Jesus said to to Thomas? And Thomas said, I'm not going to believe unless... (laughs) In fact, he said in literal Greek, there is absolutely no way I'm going to believe unless I see his hands. Touch him. What did Jesus say to him? Thomas... He says, you have believed because you have seen, touched, essentially. Blessed is the person who doesn't see and who believes. That's faith, right? Go with me to Hebrews. Hold your place. Go to Hebrews chapter 11. And we want to pick it up at verse 1 and 2, and then we're going to skip over to verse 11. It says, now faith is assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things, what? Say it, not seen. For by it, the men of old gained approval. Now, verse 11, by faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive, even beyond the proper time of life, since she considered him faithful who had promised. She considered him faithful, who had promised. Uh, The Phillips translation, I don't know if you have that translation. I love that the Phillips translation. It's been out for a number of years now. But here's how it renders the first two verses. It says, now faith means that we have full confidence in the things we hope for. It means being certain of things we cannot see. So here's number two on how we arrive at that great faith of Abraham. We must be, believe or be willing to believe the un- unbelievable. Must be willing to believe the unbelievable. Sometimes we have moments when we say, God, it's, I, I want to believe you, but I'm struggling. And that's when we say, God, help my unbelief. I'm willing to believe the unbelievable. Why don't you go to, Ro- uh, you're in Romans, so go to Romans chapter 8, 24 and 25. It says, for in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance We wait eagerly. We wait eagerly for it. Now let's make a 
clarification here. When you see the word hope in the Bible, it's not the same as what you think of in the world. In the world we say we hope I, I get this job, we hope uh, this person comes, we hope, you know, we can go on and on. It's, a, it, 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 it's Maybe it will, maybe it won't, but in the biblical sense, when you read the word hope, it means having a fixed confidence that regardless of my circumstance, regardless of what's happening in my life, God is going to come through. Now, will he deliver us from that? No, not necessarily every time, but he will come through to walk through whatever the circumstance is with us and to carry us to the other side. That's a promise. That's a fixed confidence. Now, There are impossible situations and probably in all of our lives here. It may not be as impossible as Abraham's impossibility. But I'm sure that there's somebody, something in your life that you, that's a, you, you, you said it's, it's impossible. And maybe you've ceased to pray. This message today, this text today is for you. In verse 19, Paul amplifies the fact that it's not based upon circumstances. Look at verse 19 back in chapter 4. It says, Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since um, he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Now, I should point out that there's some translations that have the word not. It says he considered not his own body. That, if you have that translation, you want to strike through that particular word because the word not is it not in the best of the original manuscripts. It means that he did consider his own body at this time. In fact, the word contemplate there or consider, whatever your translation may be, is made up of two Greek words, niao, a noao, which means to think, and then kata, which means on top of. So it literally would be, mean to think on top of thinking. In other words, to, to so analyze something. That word came to mean to consider attentively, to fix one's mind and one's uh, eyes upon it, to study it. And so we did. Abraham studied, looked at his own body and said, <laughs> I don't see how this is going to happen. Hmm. In fact, the, the word now dead, that phrase I should say is made up of just one word in the Greek, but it's a perfect participle, uh, which means that it is at a point in time he considered his body dead and he continued to think of his body as being dead. Continues on. It means that Abraham, as far as the act of procreation, viewed his body as having died. It was, as a result, in a condition in which it would stay dead. Now, some people are under the impression that to have faith is to always ignore facts. Not so. In fact, to see faith in facts Some see faith in facts as mutually exclusive. Faith without reason is fideism, which is basically a blind leap in the dark. Reason without faith is rationalism. So follow me on this. In the practice of life, in daily life, there must be no submission or reduction of faith to reason. And likewise, again, follow me, there should be no reduction or submission of reason to faith. Biblical faith is the composite of the two. Now follow me here. Abraham did not take an unreasoning leap in the dark of faith. No. So you say, well, how do you, how do you get to this faith then? How do you get there? He weighed the human possibility or impossibility. 
He looked at, he looked at this body, he said, this body, it's impossible for this body to give life. But then he weighed that against the impossible, now follow this, he weighed that against the impossibility that God could lie and that God could go back on his promises. Who wins out then? God. That's, it's an example to us. If you're struggling with the belief in something that, that's impossible, stand God up beside it and say, can God go back on his lie? Can we go, go back on his work and he lie? No, no. Dr. F. F. Bruce, who was a one time before he passed away, was considered the world leader as far as the Greek scholar. And he said the patriarch believed the bare word of God. That's what he did. He believed the bare word of God. When God came to the final time to God came to the final time to announce that they were going to have a baby. Abraham, as you we've already read, was hundred years old. Sarah was ninety years old. And from a human standpoint, hopeless, right? Abraham removed and he refused a lot of the circumstances to after his What a lesson for us as individuals in churches are looking at the circumstances. down every day she forgot the past forgot the seasons it's hopeless and God tells us not to look at the circumstances but to be big godders now from verse 20 we see that Abraham did not vacillate. Let's read verse 20. It says, Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. The word waver is an interesting word. Uh, I find it a fascinating word when I read it. It's made up of two Greek words, dia, which means either to or divide or through. And then it, the word Crino, the word crino is the root word, basic word for judge or judgment. And so it means in a literal sense to judge between two, to separate. Today we use the, might use the word doubt. In fact, real quickly, going back to James uh, chapter 1, verse 6, it says, but he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from it. Being a, now watch, it, watch this, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Now that word is not the same word, but it's, it has the same, communicates the same idea. It basically is double soul. Double soul. In other words, he's saying a, a one who doubts, is, he's torn. He's pulled in two different directions. He wants to believe, but at the same time, he's looking at the circumstance, and he has consternation over that. But this is saying Abraham didn't have that. Yes, he looked at his body, looked at the impossible situation, but he didn't waver. John Calvin said it wisely. He said, believers are never so enlightened that there are no remains of ignorance, nor is the heart so established that there are no misgivings. I mean, 
Can you imagine the, the conversation that Abraham had with Sarah? He comes back that day and his, Sarah says, where you been, Abraham? He said, well, I've been out having devotion, having my devotion. And she says, well, how'd that go? Well, it went really well. I, I talked to God. She says, oh, yeah? What did he say? Well, he says, you're going to have a baby. Can you imagine that? <laughs> yeah. I'm sure there were moments, and obviously we know that as they waited, there was that consternation. But again, Abraham's majestic perception of his God was what built his faith. It was all about who God was, not about his circumstance. That's what this passage is saying over and over. It's not about your circumstance, not about the, the broken car or truck or the appliances in your house or broken whatever relationship. It's about the God who wants to work in that circumstance and prove himself true. Now, Let's read verse 20 again. It says, yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief. Now here it is. But grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. The apostle Paul gives us an objective of this faith. It is that faith is to grow. Abraham's faith was made strong. His faith grew. And so here's number three. To, to arrive at Abraham's faith, the kind of faith that he had, you must have a growing faith. You must have a growing faith. Your faith may begin like a tiny mustard seed, but you're not to remain with that kind of faith. The more you trust, the more muscles that are put on you. The more you exercise, the greater your endurance you have, stamina you have. I get on the treadmill four to five nights a week or days a week. Sometimes I'm lifting weights when I get done. I know I have to do that in order just to keep good health. And so there are times I don't feel like doing it, but I know I have to do that. The same has to be applied to our, to our faith, that we have to exercise and have. And how do we do that, we would ask. Someone would say, well, that sounds good, Morgan, but I, you know, I'd love to do that, but how does that work? Well, you know how it works. Look at verse 21. It says, In being fully persuaded, or fully assured, your Bible may have us persuaded, being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. I get a hold of this. This, is, this, ver- this word is so rich, the word assured. It's a phoreo, which means to be filled with confidence. It's Connected, it has, it, it, let's put it this way. Its cousin, first cousin, is the word plirao, which means to be filled. And so what it's saying here, that you're filled with confidence. And, it has the, and the construction of it means that someone fills you with confidence, that it's done from the outside in. You don't do it. You can't do it yourself. You're, something, something acts upon you, and how does it act? Who is that? It's the Holy Spirit. In the Word of God. The Holy Spirit takes the Word of God. What does, what does the Bible say? Faith cometh by hearing what? Hearing by the Word of God. Verse 21 is a tremendously powerful passage because it states that Abraham believed that what God had promised he was able to do. And that tells us that the test of one's faith isn't a test of circumstances, it's not the question of logic, it's not the test of age or geography. It's a test of the size of God. How big is our God? Now, in the remaining passage section, as we kind of bring this thing, as we kind of bring this thing, To whom it 
those who believe in who raised Jesus from the dead. And don't miss that. That's a phrase you want to get. Those who raised Jesus from the dead. He who was delivered over because of our transgression was raised because of our justification. How many times does he reference the resurrection of Christ? Twice right there in that passage. And he's made reference to it throughout these, this section. Here's the point. Faith begins in the past. Faith begins in the past. In the past, Jesus was raised from the dead. Every time I'm encount- I encounter a circumstance that, that, where there's doubt that kind of begins to filter into my mind, I go back to the resurrection. I said, did Jesus rise from the dead? Yes. Then he proved that he is who he said he is. Will he lie? No, he will not lie. Will he keep his promises? Yes, he will keep his promises. You see? Let me illustrate it this way. We used uh, uh, one of the Braves a few weeks ago. Was it Robert? Is it uh, Robert Acuna? Who is that? Is that his name? Or the, uh, the the baseball player Acuna? Ron, Ron, okay, Ronald. I knew some. We started with an R. Um, let's say he hits a home run. What happens when the ball goes over the fence? And those irritating fireworks go off in your ear. And the people are applauding. Well, has he scored the run yet? When does the score go up on the board? When, when he crosses home plate. Now, can anybody throw him out? That's why he takes his time running the bases. Now, he has no fear that somebody's going to throw that ball back into the field and somebody's going to throw it to home plate, and the the ball's going to be waiting there for him. He has no fear of that, right? All he has to do is touch the bases. Christ hit the home run when he died on the cross and rose from the grave. To make everything that's available for us, that's in the Bible, where he says he's blessed us with all spiritual blessings, all we have to do is accept what Christ has done for us. Run the bases, touch the bases. That's all we have to do. No one's going to throw us out. No one's going to get us out. All we, do, all we have to do is to appropriate. And that's the point here. He was driving home. Paul was driving home the fact that, listen, everything I've said up to this point, again, is all about faith on the basis of grace, not works. And let me say that if you're watching online and you, you come across this message, maybe weeks later, If you've never trusted Christ, I want you to know that he hit that home run for you. When he died on the cross and rose from the grave. That you might have eternal life and that that you would have a standing before God that is unbelievable. A standing that he says has the prism of Christ's perfect righteousness. God looks at you through that prism. No longer does he see you in your sin, but he sees you now, clothed in, with the righteousness of, of Christ. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And we as God's children shout out and say, well, amen. Should be an amen there somewhere. <laughs>